Hello, in this podcast, we are looking at threats to biodiversity, and our learning target for this podcast is to describe threats to biodiversity. Now, we're looking at the threats in this podcast, we're not looking at any solutions to the threats. Those will be the subjects of the next several podcasts. First, we're going to look at a few species that are extinct. Now, this is a picture of the Labrador duck that went extinct in 1871, and this one, of course, is not a living duck, it's stuffed. These ducks were native to Long Island. And the way these ducks became extinct was they used to nest on the rocky shores um, in, on New England and also parts of Long Island. And sailors who wanted to have fresh eggs would come ashore and they would take their eggs. And what happened was it became quite obvious that they were going extinct. There were only a few left. And one of the naturalists working for the Museum of Natural History decided that uh, it was time to save the, the remaining few. So he went out there and he caught them killed them and saved them. And here's one of them, and, the, and a few of them are on display to museum of natural history, and they're safe for us to see. Well, back then, our ideas of saving them were a bit different than they are today. Here's one of the most famous extinctions in the United States that, was, that we have caused. This is a passenger pigeon. These are also stuffed passenger pigeons. They're on display in the museum of natural history. This was once the most abundant bird in the United States. It flocks over two million birds, so if a flock of these flew overhead, it would take a couple of hours for the flock to fly overhead. And they were so abundant, it was probably unimaginable that they would go extinct, that you could buy them for a penny a piece. They went extinct in the wild in 1906, but they lasted in zoos until 1914. They didn't have to wait until historical times for there to be extinctions. These are some of the large mammals from North America. And North America, back in the Ice Age, used to have five species of elephants, hamiths and mastodons. Camels and horses actually evolved here in North America and then went over to Asia across the Bering Land Bridge and then became extinct here in North America and eventually Europeans, the Spanish in particular, brought horses back to North America. And also you need to know about mass extinctions and these are some of the major ones. And the most famous one is the Cretaceous one, 65, 65 million years ago, and that wiped out all the dinosaurs except for one group of birds. And the largest one of all time is the Permian, which was 250 million years ago, which was before the dinosaurs evolved, and that wiped out 95% of all species. The Quaternary one, that was the one at the end of the Ice Age. That was the one that wiped out the megafauna that we saw before. We believe that that was probably caused by humans. One thing to realize, though, is that extinctions are natural. Like, like except for the mass extinction that is occurring right now, the mass extinctions were all natural. Also realize that 99% of all species are extinct. And the background rate appears to be about one species per decade, but we have increased this rate 100 to 1,000 over here that is one of the ones that appears to be going naturally is the Tasmanian devil. They're, they're suffering from a disease right now, and they may end up going extinct from that disease. One related species to the Tasmanian devil is the Tasmanian wolf, and that has already gone extinct. And I have a video here of the last of the Tasmanian wolves. What we're looking at here, this is a Tasmanian tiger. And this actually is the last Tasmanian tiger. This the species went extinct in the 1930s. This film was taken of the very last one in existence in 1933. And it went extinct for a number of reasons. One was hunting. Bounties were actually placed on on them uh, because they were eating they're eating sheep and other another life because they're eating sheep and other livestock. And the bounties were actually placed within five years of its uh, extinction. And there are other reasons why it became extinct, too. It wasn't just that. There were also diseases, also habitat destruction, and competition with wild dogs. Now, for the human-caused extinctions, it's important to remember the acronym HIPPO. HIPPO tells you, if you remember HIPPO, you will remember the main causes of human extinction. HIPPO stands for habitat destruction, invasive species, pollution, population, over-harvesting. We're going to go through each of these one by one. 
And for all these, it's actually really a summary. There's a lot more to each of these. This pie chart here shows you the overall causes of them, shows you that most of the causes of animal extinction are the species introductions, the invasive species. And then after that, it would be habitat destruction, and then hunting, which is the overharvesting, and then the rest is the other. First is habitat destruction. And habitat destruction is the most important extinction threat for most terrestrial species, though also some aquatic habitats are destroyed too by, by climate change and, and bottom trawling. Probably the best place to see habitat destruction is in Manhattan itself, because the way Manhattan is right now is completely different from the way that it was 400 years ago. And if you Google Wallachia, you can find a site here and this can show you approximately what Manhattan looked like 400 years ago. Now if we go over here to say Times Square and just click on the square here and we'll see what it looked like. So here are the types of animals that most likely lived around Times Square 400 years ago. We had voles, mice, deer, beavers, squ flying squirrels, squirrels. Well, squirrels, even there you probably find squirrels around Times Square today. We had rabbits, raccoons, or well, raccoons you find, chipmunks, bats. The Lenape are the um, Native Americans who live in the area and they did not, looks like they did not live in that area, but they did hunt in that area. As to what the landscape was like, it was, it was like it was mostly a hillside area. And it was mostly an oak tulip tree forest. So if you go to Alley Pond Park and you walk through the forest there, that's basically what Times Square looked like. You go to go to downtown Manhattan, you'll find that a lot of downtown Manhattan wasn't there. See here's the FDR Drive and the FDR Drive is in the middle of the water. Like over here is the over here is the park where Battery Park and Click in that area here. I don't know why they got those probabilities right there, but the landscape of this area here. It's marine deep water community mostly. It's uh, it was underwater. Uh, what they did is they expanded this whole area of Manhattan. A lot of Manhattan is area is expanded. Barry Park City is the most recent area that, that was expanded when they built the Twin Towers, they built this huge pit and they took the landfill from that area and they dumped it in the ocean, not the ocean, they dumped it over here in the harbor and they built Battery Park City. And where they expanded it is, expanded these areas is they would have people just come out and dump their garbage and they expanded and that's how, and they just built the buildings on top of that. And right over here is a collection pond and that was the city's source of water until they polluted it with tanneries. This part here, the Lower East Side. What was this area here? The Salt Marsh. Today, Manhattan has only one area that's a salt marsh. And let me show you that area. A lot of New York City still has a lot of salt marsh, like Jamaica Bay is still is most, has a lot of salt marsh. And when you drive towards the five towns, you look like right here is a salt marsh in Inwood Park. Now Inwood Park itself right here, this is the only area where you really see the topology, where you really see the area like today, what it was like back then. 
with the landscape back then. See over here was mostly it was oak pine forest, oak hickory forest. It's basically still like that today. Except the they're past there, they're paved. Uh, by the way, there was once a uh, there, there was once an Indian village here, and I believe it was also once an Indian reservation. Harlem. This area here was once a grassland. Hempstead Plains grassland. There's one area where you can still see this type of grassland, and that's near the Roosevelt Field Mall. The rest of those grasslands are basically gone. So far as the old, the original old growth forest in the New York area, there's really only one place where you see it because the British during the Revolutionary War to support their troops, they cut down just about all the forest for firewood and for other things. The only place which has been preserved is in the New York Botanical Gardens in their forest there. Invasive species are also a big problem. There are 50,000 invasive species in North America and here are pictures showing a bunch of them. Probably the most infamous of them are, is the zebra mussel that hitched a ride in the ballast from Europe. In the, in the ballast, it hitched a ride in the ballast of some ocean-going ship from Europe and it's, it easily travels from lake to lake and I'll show you how that does in two news broadcasts. And for our ecosystems, we're talking about zebra mussels. These creatures are causing havoc in Smithville Lake. Ben Chandler explains how. These carp had new guests at Smithville Lake recently and they weren't welcome. This is a major concern for us uh, because this affects everybody who uses the lake. These shells house that major concern, zebra mussels. Indigenous to Europe, they were introduced into U.S. waters some 30 years ago. And all they've done since is cause trouble for boating equipment. They'll attach to the docks, they'll attach to props, they'll attach to intakes. And for a lake's ecosystem. Really, they have very limited natural competitors for food or anything else. So from what we've seen, they just they just explode. They're going to basically clean it up to the point the fish have, the young of the year fish have very little to feed on. The mussels were spotted over the 4th of July holiday. This is the first time they have been seen in Smithville Lake. But because of the reputation, those at the lake were on the lookout. Some of uh, the staff in the Department of Conservation have, have routinely been swimming the, the docks uh, on Smithville Lake to look for this very thing. The mussels were found in just one boat lift in this marina, giving hope that they have not spread throughout the lake. At this point, we're really not indicating this lake is invested with zebra mussels. We think we have everything under control. The Department of Conservation is looking for funding to treat this area, just to be sure. Ben Chandler, NBC Action News. The mussels are introduced to new lakes by equipment that has been brought from an infested body of water. The Department of Conservation stresses the importance of always checking your boating equipment for the mussels when transporting it between lakes. The Department of Conservation has a fight on their hands. This time it's hitting close to home. Jonathan Gody tells us how they plan to win the battle over a tiny nuisance that can cause big problems. Smithville Lake is a boater and fisherman's paradise, and the Missouri Department of Conservation wants to keep it that way. But they're in a battle with these tiny zebra mussels, which have conservationists worried. They move into an area, they have unlimited amounts of food, they grow pr prolifically, uh, they take over the habitat that normal native species would use, they clog intake pipes, they stick to your holes of your boats, uh, they just become a huge nuisance once they get established. Ryan says they noticed the invasive species last fall and began planning a strategy to eliminate them. Today Today, they finally treated the lake with Cutrine Plus, an environmentally safe algicide. The Department of Conservation is applying 400 gallons of the chemical around the Camp Branch Marina, hoping to kill off the mussels, which threaten the food supply for native fish. They also cling to boat docks, props, and pumping stations. Conservationists say the mussels can be transported from lake to lake, mostly by boaters not even knowing they're adding to the problem. You want to clean your, your boats and your trailers before you move them from lake to lake. Uh, you want to let them dry out or just totally decontaminate them before you move them from one body to the other. Zebra mussels have already infested numerous lakes and rivers on both sides of the state line. Conservation Department will check on Smithville Lake over the next year, but believe today's procedure will prove successful. Jonathan Gody, NBC Action News. Conservation agents say today's treatment is environmentally friendly and will not harm the drinking supply, nor will it cause any harm to boaters, skiers, or swimmers. Mm. Pollution is another source. 
Several of these we've already covered in a sense. We've covered bioaccumulation and how that can affect it and that almost made species like the bald eagle go extinct. Lead poisoning is another because pe people go hunting and they fire lead shot and then birds will think it's seeds and will eat the lead and they get lead poisoning. And overloading of nutrients is a big one and here's a video to show you how the overloading of nutrients from fertilizer can cause serious problems in the Gulf of Mexico. Like a red tide but lasting months, the Gulf of Mexico's dead zone grows to about the size of New Jersey every summer. The water becomes so low in oxygen that crabs and bottom feeding fish like red snapper and brown shrimp cannot live there. Researchers use oxygen meters to map the dead zone along the coast of Louisiana. The Mississippi drains about a third of the United States. It carries dissolved fertilizer from the Corn Belt into the Gulf. Tiny creatures called phytoplankton thrive on the nutrients, but when they die, the bacteria that eat them use up all the oxygen in the water, and that suffocates the lowest part of the food chain. And many of the fish that depend on feeding on the bottom need a variety of things. They need, they need crabs, they need gastropods, they need bivalves, they need shrimps. So while fish and shrimp can move out of the dead zone, there's no food for them to eat when they come back. Types of fisheries are different now than they were in the past. There's more forage fish like menhaden than the fish that live on the bottom. That's a very typical response of an ecosystem to too many nutrients. And the forage fish, while they may have a lot of tonnage, they're not as valuable a fishery as those that live on the bottom, particularly the brown shrimp. The levels of nutrients flowing into the Gulf are still near their historic highs, and Congress has not funded a plan to reduce those levels by 30 percent and to start putting some life back into the dead zone. Now, the population, basically as human population grows, uh, increasing population leads to needing more resources and that is pretty much the ultimate cause of all of the other problems. Over harvesting is another one and the overfishing is a problem too. We talked about that before with tragedy of the commons. Here's a video I want to show you about bushmeat. Though recognized as an endangered species since 1975, chimpanzee numbers are still in critical decline. When I began in 1960, there were at least one million chimpanzees right across to West Africa. And today, no more than 150,000 at most. At the heart of their declining population is an alarming practice. It's not just that their habitat's disappearing, which it is, just as it has here, but it's also that they're hunted. They're hunted to some extent for the live animal trade, but they're also hunted for meat, along with gorillas and bonobos and elephants and everything that walks or flies in the forests of, of Congo and West Africa. It's called the bushmeat trade. And this has grown because the old kind of subsistence hunting that has been a way of life for the people in the forests for hundreds of years has changed because logging companies and to some extent mining companies have made roads deep into the heart of the last remaining forest. And this provides access for the hunters from the towns who go to the end of the logging road and shoot everything for food. Chimpanzees, gorillas, elephants, antelopes, monkeys, birds, bats. They dry it in the sun or they smoke it and they ship it into the towns. As commercial logging has expanded, the practice has only become more widespread. And when it's done on a commercial scale, it can wipe out the wildlife in a forest, even when the forest is left standing. Well, uh, I'm not sure anyone knows how big the bushmeat trade is, but it's uh, estimated to be a billion dollar industry. This is the rarest living animal in all the world. There is none rarer. This is Lonesome George. He's about the same age as I am, but his story starts a very long time ago. In the 17th century, when human beings first came to the Galapagos, there were about 15 different kinds 
of giant tortoise. When the first ships arrived here, there were thousands of each kind of tortoise. But then people began to slaughter the tortoises for meat. They discovered the remarkable fact that these creatures could live for a year without water or food. So they took them on board their ships and slaughtered them at sea. The tortoises on Pinta Island were apparently exterminated. But then, in 1971, it was discovered that there was one lonely single survivor. That was Lonesome George. This film was taken over 30 years ago by the team that brought George back to the Charles Darwin Research Station. The scientists hoped that another pinta tortoise might be discovered in some corner of his island or even in a zoo somewhere in the world, but none has ever been found. So now George lives in his own enclosure, completely safe but entirely by himself. He's the last of his kind. One thing you may not realize here is with uh, exotic pets and plants. Many cacti that you buy in the store, people just go out into the American Southwest and they just pick up, cac pick up cacti and they, and they sell them. A lot of orchids are picked out in the wild. A lot of tropical fish just taken out of the rivers and tropical rainforests. Quite a few reptiles, amphibians, and mammals, the exotic ones. Those are taken out of the wild. Now to come to our concluding questions. Number one, which was the largest mass extinction? Number two, what does hippo stand for? Number three, give an example for each of the letters in hippo. And that concludes this podcast, and I will see you in class tomorrow.